The Peter Schiff Show. Well, we had widespread selling in the markets today. It was real carnage across the board. Everything went down except the U.S. dollar. The Dow Jones was down almost 400 points, 394. Uh, But percentage wise, uh, that was only about 2 percent. That wasn't bad compared to what happened uh, in other indexes and other sectors. In fact, when it comes to the Dow Jones averages, the utilities were the weakest. They were down almost 4 percent, 3.7 percent. The Nasdaq was down two and a half percent. The composite down 133 points. But various sectors were hit very hard, uh, particularly the interest rate sensitive sectors. I mentioned the utilities, but the home builders got crushed. Emerging markets got obliterated. Gold stocks were down big. In fact, I think gold stocks were down about 5 percent, 5.5 percent on the day, almost 6 percent. And that's on basically a six six tenths of a percent decline in the price of gold. I mean, gold was only down about 10 bucks, uh, but gold stocks were down much more. Now, silver dropped about 50 cents. Remember, all the way back down to 19. It was over 20 bucks a couple of days ago when I recorded the last podcast. And, you know, you might think, what's going on? I mean, it's just been two days when I did the last podcast Gold was soaring. The dollar was tanking. uh, The markets were going up. Why? Why were the markets so excited a couple of days ago? Well, we got horrible economic data. I mean, the economic data that we got uh, so far for August basically confirms that we have the weakest economy maybe in six years. And if you remember, what caused the markets to be concerned was the Janet Yellen Jackson Hole statement that the case for a rate hike had strengthened, and that was based on the economic data that came out in maybe June and July. Well, based on the data that's come out since she made that speech, this is data about August, that case has now weakened considerably because the August data shows that the data that we got in June or July that might have been positive was a fluke, an outlier, a one-off event, because now we're right back in the the weakening mode. And so if the Fed really were data dependent, which is what Janet Yellen said, well, now the data is awful. So why would they hike rates? And that's exactly what happened. The market started to take those rate hikes off the table. Now, I thought I never thought they were on the table to begin with, but there were people that that bought into it. But when they saw this horrible data and they knew the Fed was data dependent, the markets reacted. Well, now in the last couple of days, particularly today, People are now questioning whether or not the Fed is actually data dependent, and they're thinking that they're going to raise interest rates even if the data is bad. Now, what would make them jump to such a conclusion? Well, we had several Fed officials, both yesterday and today, who basically continued to talk about the possibility of rate hikes, and nobody has acknowledged the weakening economic data that has come out. Now, I've said many times, they don't want to acknowledge that data. That that plays into Donald Trump's campaign. They'd be peddling fiction. They don't want to talk about a weakening economy, so they have to ignore the data. But the fact that they are ignoring the data while they're saying they're data dependent and they still talk about the possibility of rate hikes, that's got everybody scared. But, you know, what a possibility of a hike. I mean, all these guys say is they don't rule out the possibility. Well, a possibility is not a probability, and it's certainly not a certainty. But the markets are acting as if the Fed is about to raise rates, and that's why everybody is so scared. Now, it's not just the Fed, because yesterday— Uh, Draghi in a press conference, he was asked about, you know, what are you going to do when this QE program ends and is scheduled to end uh, sometime, maybe I think the first quarter next year. And he basically said, well, we don't have any plans to do more QE. And we had some similar statements coming out of the Bank of Japan to the extent that, you know, they're not going to do anything more. And this is scaring the markets because the markets have been riding a sea of liquidity. 
from all over the world. And if the Bank of Japan is not going to be providing more liquidity, if the ECB is not going to be doing it, and now if the Fed is going to take away its punch bowl, this is what's scary markets all around the world. Because it's not just, again, U.S. markets are not the only ones that sold off. Markets are selling off around the world. And it's not just the stock markets. It's the bond markets, European bonds, Japanese bonds. Look at U.S. bonds. Yields now are the highest they've been in three months. I mean, we've had a two-day spike in the uh, yield on the 10-year to the 30-year. And this is really going to crush the housing market. That's why the home builders uh, got obliterated today. I think the biggest loser was Hovanian, which had some bad news, but they were about about 13%. But all these home builders got clobbered because if interest rates go up, houses are going to get that much less unaffordable than they already are. Uh, But the, the question is why all of a sudden, in just a couple of days, are, are people so convinced that the Fed's going to raise rates? Now, what happened today, there was a, a Fed guy that spoke this morning, Eric Rosengreen, right? He's the Federal Reserve pa- ba- Boston, president of Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. And in his talk, he said, I'm quoting, that a reasonable case can be made for, tighten, for tightening interest rates uh, to avoid overheating the economy. So a reasonable case can be made for a gradual rate hike to avoid overheating the economy. That's what he said. Well, sure, you can make a reasonable case for raising rates gradually. I can make an even more reasonable case why we should raise them rapidly. But just because you can make a reasonable case to do something doesn't mean that they're going to do anything. And he said that we... We need to raise rates to avoid the economy overheating. I mean, what economy is he talking about? The U.S. economy? Does anybody think the U.S. economy is in danger of overheating? I mean, it's barely growing at 1%. I mean, first of all, I don't even believe the Keynesian nonsense that an economy can overheat. Like an economy is like a car. And if it goes too fast, you know, the engine is going to blow up or something. The economy can't overheat. But what Keynesians think is that if economies grow too fast— they will create too much inflation, and that's what's overheating, right? The, but inflation is not caused by economic growth, and a growing economy doesn't overheat. But if you actually believed all that Keynesian nonsense, you wouldn't look at the U.S. economy and think that it's anywhere close to overheating. So if he's saying, well, we need to raise rates simply to stop the economy from overheating, well, he's saying that rate hikes are nowhere near uh, the horizon, because the economy isn't even close to overheating. I mean, we're, we're almost ready to stall. Forget about overheating. But that was what got it going. But then we had, I watched an interview, another Fed uh, guy, uh, Dan Tarilla, I think the guy's name was, president of one of these other banks. I forget which one. He was interviewed by Steve Leesman on CNBC. And if you actually listen to what this guy said, Probably the furthest thing from his mind is a rate hike. I mean, I mean, everything he's saying was really dovish as far as I was concerned. But then kind of at the end of the interview, Steve Leisman says, well, do you think the Fed's going to raise rates this year? Do you, do you think we'll have a rate hike this year? And basically, the only thing he said in answer to the question was something like, well, I, I wouldn't want to say that it's impossible that uh, rates would go up. I mean, why would you answer a question like that? I mean, do you think rates are going to go up? Yes or no? His answer is, well, I wouldn't say it's impossible. Well, of course, it's, nothing's impossible. I mean, that doesn't even answer the question. Although to me, the fact that he answers it that way means he doesn't think rates are going to go up. Look, if somebody asked me, hey, Peter, do you think uh, you know aliens are going to invade the Earth in September? Right? I mean, obviously, I would say, no, I don't think they're going to invade the Earth. I wouldn't come back and say, well, you know, I wouldn't want to rule out a possibility. I mean, I wouldn't want to say it's impossible that aliens could invade the Earth because, of course, it's not impossible. I mean, it is possible. It is possible that there are aliens and it is possible that they'll choose September to launch their invasion. Right. All that is possible, but it is extremely improbable. So why even bring it up? So why answer that question by saying, well, you know, I I wouldn't want to say it's impossible that the Fed might raise rates. See, all of this is part of their spin. It's part of their charade, right? Keep Keep it out there. Keep the rate hike out there as if, you know, let's keep the possibility out there. But you know what? All this is blowing up in the Fed's face because I don't think they wanted the markets to tank based on the mere possibility of a rate hike. But, of course, they can't admit that raising rates is impossible, But every time they speak, 
they talk about the fact that one is possible and that has spooked the markets and now the markets are falling. And to me, we could be setting ourselves up for maybe some type of a Black Monday event. I mean, not, you know, a la 1987 Black Monday, but another big decline. You know, the Dow was down almost 400 points today. Maybe it drops another four or 500 points. Maybe it could drop a thousand. I mean, I think there's a pretty good chance that if the markets really believe that the Fed is going to hike rates this month, that we can have a 10% drop in the U.S. stock market between now and the day they're supposed to raise rates. Now, if the markets drop by 10% and it looks like they're going to keep falling, what's the Fed going to do? Is the Fed going to raise rates? No, they're not. Every other time. See, with the, when the market starts, when the Fed starts to prepare the market for a rate hike, then the markets tank. And now the Fed can hate, hike rates. I guarantee you, if the market really tanks and we're down 10%, what is the Fed going to start talking about? QE4. They're going to start talking about how monetary conditions have now tightened, right? Every time the market goes down, oh, monetary conditions have tightened, right? Oh, the case for, for uh, raising rates has now weakened. That's what they're going to say. So it's the same old thing all over again. And when are people going to figure out that the Fed can't raise rates? Now, I was watching on CNBC, and these guys are now starting to get, you know, they're, they're questioning. I was watching Art Cashin, and he said, wait a minute. The Fed is data dependent. They tell us they're data dependent. The data is awful, yet they're still talking about raising rates. So what's going on? And now they're saying, well, maybe they're going to raise rates even if the data is bad. Well, why would, why would you believe that? Because they're saying they're only going to raise rates if the data is good. So why are you jumping to these conclusions? But that's what's so scary for the markets. Because remember, the, the nonsense that people were swallowing was that, well, rate hikes will be okay because the Fed is only going to rate, raise rates if the economy is strong. And a strong economy is great. It's good for stocks. It's good for corporate earnings. But if now the Fed is going to raise rates, even though the economy is weak, and then it's not good for co corporate earnings, then it's a disaster for the stock market and it's going to collapse. And, you know, one of the other myths out there is that higher rates are going to be good for the financials. You know, because the financials, yeah, you know, outperformed today. They weren't down as much as uh, other sectors, you know, some of the banks. And the reason is they think, oh, this is good. Rising interest rates is going to mean better margins for banks, right? Because the, the yield the yield curve is going to steepen. And, you know, banks borrow sh short and lend long. And if they get a steeper yield curve, that's going to be good for bank profits. This is all nonsense. The banks are going to get crushed with higher interest rates because they're not going to make more money on their loans. They're going to, they're going to end up issuing fewer loans. The problem is they're going to take a bath on the loans they've already written because those low yielding loans are going to lose a lot of value when interest rates go up. And a lot of those loans are going to go into default and the collateral is going to collapse. So banks are going to get screwed regardless. If the pet, if the fed keeps interest rates low, the, the banks are in trouble. If the Fed raises interest rates, the banks are in trouble. It's a no-win situation for the financials. That's why I don't own them. But that is the huge financial crisis that, that's coming, which is the reason the Fed isn't going to raise interest rates. You know, instead of doubting the, the data dependency, right? Because now people are saying, well, maybe the Fed isn't going to be data dependent. Maybe they're bluffing about that. Well, the real bluff is that they're going to raise rates. That's the bluff because they can't acknowledge the weakening data. People are saying, why is the Fed not acknowledging the economic weakness? They don't want to. They want to pretend the economy is strong. So that's why they have to pretend they're getting ready to raise rates. But they can't admit that they're not going to raise rates because then they have to admit the economy is not strong. But if the markets believe the Fed's going to raise rates because they don't want to admit that they're not, then the stock market tanks, the bond market tanks, and now the Fed has to come back and take the rate cuts off the table, rate hikes off the table. But now they're in an even worse position because now it looks like they're beholden to the markets, which of course they are, because remember, the entire goal of their monetary policy was to inflate asset bubbles because they believe in the trickle-down wealth effect. Well, if the whole goal of their policy was to prop up the markets, and then they say, okay, now we're going to raise rates and the markets collapse and everything they did is undone. Well, what are they supposed to do? Are they going to stand back and just allow it to happen? No, they're going to reverse the process. They're going to do more QE. They're going to cut rates. They've even said as much, right? They only want to raise rates so they can cut them. Well, the sooner they raise them, the sooner they're going to have to cut them because the act of raising them uh, 
pushes the economy into recession that much sooner. But of course, that doesn't mean they shouldn't raise rates. They should. They should raise them a lot, even though it's going to push the economy into recession because the economy needs a recession because the recession is the restructuring. The last thing we need is for this bubble to get bigger. But that's exactly what the politicians want. They want the bubble to get bigger because the alternative scares the hell out of them. They don't care that it's not real prosperity or a real recovery. They, they care more about four. They don't give a damn about substance. But, you know, the voters, of course, they care. That's why, uh, you know, you're going to see or you've seen the popularity of Bernie Sanders and you're seeing the popularity of Donald Trump. And that's why Donald Trump might surprise people. And apparently, too, in the polls now, Donald Trump is now even or maybe slightly ahead of, of Hillary Clinton. But, you know, I don't even necessarily trust these polls because I, I bet there's a lot of people that are going to vote for Trump who are not telling the pollsters they're going to vote for Trump because, you know, it's not politically correct to say you're you're you know, you're going to vote for Trump because what, what are you a racist? Right. What, so people don't want to necessarily admit that they're going to vote for Trump. But when they get into the voting booth, they're going to vote for Trump. In fact, I think there's a lot of people that are going to vote for Trump just to throw a monkey wrench into the system just to see what happens. You know, because so many people are saying, oh, it's going to be a disaster if Trump becomes president. I bet there's a lot of people that want to see that. It's almost like, you know, it's going to be really entertaining. They want to see the show. They know that if Hillary is president, it's going to be boring. It's just going to be the same old, same old. At least if Donald Trump is there, you know, it could be entertaining to see what happens. I mean, there's some people like, you know, you go to a movie and you root. Sometimes, you know, you root for the bad guys. In real life, you wouldn't, right? But, you know, it's interesting to, to, to let them get away with something. And people just want to be entertained. People are just curious to see what would happen. Is it really going to be so bad? Well, let's see. Let's shake things up. I don't know. And maybe there are people that just you don't know, want just bad things to happen. So, yeah, I'll, let's let's put Trump in there. You know, they don't care. You know, even though it's maybe it's not as bad as uh, as as the media tries to get everybody to believe, people just might want to see. Let's see for ourselves. Let's see if it really is that bad. So, but no one's going to admit that. No one's going to say, yeah, I want to vote for Donald Trump because I, I think it's going to really wreck the economy, but that's what I want. But there might be people that want that. Uh, and so I think there could be a lot of, of Trump voters out there. But I wonder if that, too, is even weighing on the markets now that Trump is, is moving in the polls. But to me, it's, it's much more the Fed. But the fact that these markets are selling off so quickly based on the specter of the possibility of a rake hike, again, shows you that there's nothing but air beneath these markets, that the whole thing is just a bubble. It's all propped up by the cheap money, because even a quarter point rate hike, that's nothing. I mean, money is still cheap. It just will be slightly less cheap, right? I've used the analogy. If you are a drug addict and you need a certain amount of heroin, if your pusher says, look, I, I, you know, I've got some heroin, but not as much as you normally take, right? You're not, it's not going to work for you. You have a certain amount of tolerance. I mean, you have a big drug addiction. You need a full dose, and so this economy is so drugged out, so dependent on such massive quantities of cheap money that even if we get the cheap money, but in a slightly less massive dose, it ain't going to be enough to sustain this habit. And this whole thing is going to come collapsing down. But of course, as it collapses down, now the Fed has to reverse. That is the catch-22. Oh, the Fed, the Fed's going to raise rates. Okay, great. But if they raise rates, the markets crash, and now they have to cut rates, which means they can never raise rates because raising rates means they have to cut them. But when are the traders going to figure this game out? Because that's what it is. It's a game. It's a game of chicken. When is the Fed? The Fed bluffs that they're going to raise rates. And initially, the market shrugs off the bluff, and so everything is okay. And then they believe the bluff, and now the markets tank. And now the question is, when does the Fed, you know, give up? When does chicken? When do, when do they when do they say uncle? And they say, okay, you're right. We're not gonna we're not gonna hike. The, the hikes are off the table now. This this game has been going on for years. The only time they they raised rates was in December, and that's because for some reason. The markets rallied into December because they got deluded into thinking that a rate hike was OK. And now the Fed said, hey, the market's kind of blessing this one. They're kind of waving us in like a baseball. It's the, 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 the base coaches say, hey, run. You can take this base. The coast is clear. Right. Uh, and the Fed actually believed the markets were giving them the all clear uh, to to raise rates. And then they raised rates and, you know, they got suckered into it because the markets tanked anyway. 
So they screwed up. They raised rates in December, and then they haven't raised them since. And so this game has been going on for a long time. Why do people just believe? Why would the Fed raise rates in September? The election's coming up in November. Why risk it? The data is horrible. The markets are falling now. What, what is that? They didn't raise rates three months ago, six months ago. Why would they raise them now? When the economy is much weaker, the markets are now falling. The election is that much closer. Trump is raising in the, rising in the polls. <clears throat> Obviously, the possibility is still remote. But the mere possibility of a tiny rate hike is all it takes to collapse these markets. And we'll see. As I said, Monday is going to be a very, very interesting day. And all of the stock market weakness is now number one. Because if the Federal Reserve is going to ignore all the, the economic data, right, because they're still talking rate hikes, even though the economic data is lousy, then the only thing left to officially take the rate hikes off the table is the stock market. And that's what's going to happen. And the traders might force it to happen because if bad economic data is not enough, let's see how how much uh, pain the Fed is willing to tolerate from the stock market and the bond market. Because we know that they believe that asset prices are very important to the economy, certainly housing prices and uh, the real estate market, also the auto sector. And that's going to be uh, impacted by rising rates. But also from a political perspective, we know that the incumbent party is more likely to be reelected during a bull market than a bear market. So they got to know if the Fed causes a stock market decline and if we are in a bear market when voters enter the voting booth, they're going to vote Trump. And so you have all of this that's going to weigh on the Fed. The question is, how much more credibility will the Fed lose? It's crazy that they still have any credibility when they don't raise rates in September, because this is the danger. You know, they let everybody think, yeah, they're actually considering it. They're actually going to do it. And then they don't do it. And now what are they going to do the same game all over again with December? Finally, I want to talk about the Gary Johnson Aleppo controversy and if you haven't heard about this, and maybe you have, because this is probably the most publicity that Gary Johnson has received since he announced that he was going to run for president. In fact, I even saw the story on the NBC Nightly News. And of course, the headlines are Gary Johnson blows his shot, right? This is it, you know, as if he actually had a shot and now he blew it because of this one, one slip up. Look, the, to the extent that Gary Johnson doesn't become president, it's not because he didn't know what or where Aleppo was. It's because the media wasn't covering his campaign. It's because the Presidential Commission on Debates isn't inviting him to debate. It's got nothing to do uh, with, you know, with this. And in fact, if anything, maybe this is going to blow up because maybe all this extra publicity will cause more people to take a look at Gary Johnson and a lot of people that don't like Trump and don't like Clinton. And I think it might backfire. And I think uh, Gary Johnson poll numbers will actually rise as a result of what everybody claimed just destroyed his non-existent chances of, of being president, right? But here, basically what happened is he was on the, the Morning Joe show and on MSNBC. And you know, MSNBC is, you know, very, very liberal network, although Morning Joe is supposedly the one, uh, you know, non-liberal show on, on MSNBC. But Gary Johnson's on there. And there's two or three other people sitting around a table uh, talking to Gary Johnson. And... You know, they're, they're having a conversation about his chances of winning, what his strategy is. They're not talking policy at all. They're not they're not asking him a single question about what he would do as president. It's all about, you know, are you taking votes from Hillary or taking votes from Trump? What's your strategy? What's your plan? Right. Not, nothing about actual like, you know, what are you going to do about anything? Right. And then out of the blue, he's asked a question, says, what are you going to if you become president? What are you going to do about Aleppo? Now, I mean, it's the, the question comes out of left field. And, and so Gary Johnson's like, Aleppo, what's Aleppo? And um, the guy says, are you serious? You don't know what Aleppo is? And he says, no, I, I don't. I don't. What is it? Right. And of course, it's a city in Syria. And there's, you know, probably the epicenter of the refugee crisis in Syria. But ask out of context. I mean, if he had said, if the question had been, what are you going to do about the refugee crisis in Aleppo, Syria? Right. He would have known what he was talking about. But just someone asked you a question. You're on live TV. Look, and I've, I've been on Morning Joe a couple times. I've been on live TV. You know, you got cameras on you. You don't really know. And someone asked you, you know, what's, what are you going to do about Aleppo? I mean, it might not occur to you that it's Aleppo, Syria. 
Apparently, what he said later is he thought it was some kind of an acronym, that it, it, it stood for something, like American, something like, ah, he didn't know. Maybe it was something he didn't know what it was. And at least he had the honesty to say, hey, I don't know what that is, right? Because most politicians will never admit when they don't know something. And, you know, they don't know very much. But normally what a politician would say that's more skilled is you would say, if someone says, well, what are you going to do about Aleppo? I would say, well, can you, can you uh, be a little more specific? Right? And then let him be more specific. And then he would have said, well, what are you going to do about the refugee crisis? And then he would have known how to answer the question. Right? Or he could have done what most politicians do when they get a question where they don't know the answer or they know the answer, but they don't want to admit it. They just change the subject, just regurgitate a talking point. And then if they ask the question again, just ignore it again. And when you ignore it two or three times, then they'll go on to another question. But to me, this was a gotcha. This was a deliberate attempt to slip him up. Because, first of all, who cares? What are you going to do about Aleppo? I mean, what can he do about it? He's not running for the president of Syria. He's not running for the president of the world. He's running to be president of the United States. Ask him what he's going to do about a city in America, not a city in Syria. I mean, there's nothing the U.S. president can do about what's going on over there. It's mean, it's not like a national security threat to the United States. It's not like asking, what are you going to do about a country that represents a threat to America? I mean, it's a problem that's going on, but it's not something that is an imminent threat to the United States, and it's not in the United States. I mean, why pick that question? All the important policy questions that you can ask him, right? What are you going to do about Aleppo? I mean, it seems like they asked the question hoping that he wouldn't know. Because, see, why didn't they say, what are you going to do about Syria? Right? What are you going to do about the refugee crisis? They didn't use the word refugee. They didn't use the word Syria. Just Aleppo. And, in fact, if you go and read the coverage of this, like you read the New York Times story, and it says Gary Johnson didn't know uh, where where Aleppo, Syria was, or he didn't understand when he was asked about the the, um, the um, refugee crisis in Aleppo, Syria, his answer was, what's Aleppo? That wasn't what he was asked. He wasn't asked about the refugee crisis or about Syria. The only thing he was asked was, what are you going to do about Aleppo? <laughs> That's it. So if you actually see the entire interview and you see how this question comes out of left field, without any context, you know, they're not talking foreign policy. They're not talking refugees. They're not talking Syria. They're talking about strategy uh, to win the election and how are you, you know, how are you going to position yourself and who you're taking votes away from. Right. And all of a sudden, what are you going to do about Aleppo? And it's like, what's Aleppo? As if this means he's not qualified to be president. And look, first of all, does the president have to know everything? No. That's why they got some advisors. I mean, look at all these advisors. Look at these teams of economic advisors. I mean, if the president knew everything, then why would he need any advisors? Why would he have to have a cabinet, right? If your president is omnipotent, if he knows everything, then why don't we save money and fire all these guys? Supposedly, the reason that the president has such a big cabinet, has so many advisors, is because they don't know that much. So they have to rely on people that know more than them. So that's what Gary Johnson would supposedly do if he was president, right? He'd have some advisors uh, that know more about Syria than he does, or more about Aleppo. I mean, I mean, well, you, you, do you do you think uh, Hillary Clinton? I mean, you think she, you know, or um, or or Donald Trump can answer all all these questions if you gave him a quiz on geography or you know naming cities? But you know, even I'm sure I bet that Gary Johnson, if if you would have said, uh, what city is you know what country is the city of Aleppo in? I bet he would have said Syria. Or if you would have said, can you name a city in Syria, he might have said Aleppo, right? But if you just hear the word Aleppo and without the context of Syria, you might not make the connection, especially on live TV. But the media, I think that this was their plan. Hey, let's let's ask him this trick question. He won't know. He won't remember. Maybe he won't remember that, that Aleppo is a city in Syria. We'll just ask him what he can do about Aleppo and see what he says. Because to me, I think they were prepared for the whole thing. And then they immediately launched this, okay, his campaign is dead. It's dead? It, when, when was it alive? Now all of a sudden it's dead? But I think that he is pulling some votes away from, uh, from Hillary Clinton. And by the way, too, I think so is Jill Stein. And I think one of the reasons that the left does not want Gary Johnson in the debates is because if they let Gary Johnson in the debates, and let's say Gary Johnson doesn't have 15%. Right. Let's say he's got 12 or 13 percent and they let him in the debates. Well, they probably have to let Jill Stein in the debates, too. Right. Because, I mean, if they're if they're going to make an exception for Gary Johnson, they got to make a, an exception from Jill Stein. 
And Jill Stein is not going to take any votes away from uh, from Donald Trump. All the votes she's going to take are going to be from Hillary Clinton. Gary Johnson may pull evenly from both Clinton and, and Trump. But the best thing for Trump and the worst thing for Hillary is to have both Gary Johnson and Jill Stein at those debates. And the only way to get Jill Stein in the debates is to get Gary Johnson in the debates. So I think MSNBC is trying to crush Gary Johnson to keep out uh, Jill Stein. But also to the extent that, you know, Johnson will pull some votes from her. But I think that they're more worried about about Jill Stein. And this is a backdoor way to try to keep her out of the debates by trying to diminish the credibility of Gary Johnson simply because he supposedly didn't know uh, that Aleppo was a city in, in, in Syria. But again, I think this whole thing might backfire on MSNBC and the rest of the liberal media, because I think now a lot of people who never even heard of Gary Johnson now know about him because of this Aleppo. And you know what? They couldn't care less whether the guy knows where Aleppo is because nobody else knows where it is either. You think the average guy who is learning about Gary Johnson for the first time, you think they know that Aleppo is in Syria? They don't even, most of them don't even know where Syria is, let alone Aleppo. But I think now that they know, what do you mean? There's a third party candidate? I mean, I don't have to choose between the lesser of these two evils? There's another candidate, and the only thing wrong with him is he doesn't know where Aleppo is? Oh, yeah, let me vote for that guy. So I think that it could backfire, and the publicity can end up uh, giving Gary Johnson a, a bump in the polls. Uh, rather than ending his campaign, uh, they might have just ignited it. Hello, this is Peter Schiff. I bet you didn't know that without silver, you wouldn't be hearing this podcast right now or be able to use a computer at all. From laptops to smartphones to TVs to speakers, virtually all modern electronics use silver to conduct electricity. Did you know that the average solar panel uses two-thirds of an ounce of silver to function? And the solar industry is expanding dramatically, not just in America, but in booming developing nations like China and India. Silver is naturally antibacterial and is used extensively in modern medicine. Silver coatings are being added to breathing tubes, bandages, catheters, and other medical instruments to reduce the spread of infections. When antibiotics fail, silver still works. I believe the 21st century will be the century of silver as fiat currencies continue to collapse and new uses are found for silver every day, the white metal strong industrial demand and low per ounce price will make it increasingly attractive to savers around the world. At today's prices, people of any age and background can afford to buy some silver. Learn why silver is a smart and reliable investment in my free special report, The Powerful Case for Silver. Visit shiftsilver.com and download it now. The powerful case for silver includes information about silver's amazing chemical properties. It also explains why I believe silver may outperform gold in the coming years. Download the powerful case for silver and educate yourself, your friends, and your family about the white metal. Just visit shiftsilver.com to download my free report. That's shiftsilver.com.